Hello, this is Dr. Mark Baxter. Thank you for joining me for this webinar on healthy eating, energy, and metabolism. I think you'll get a lot out of today's presentation. Today we're going to cover food is fuel for energy. We're going to cover the glycemic index for balancing blood sugar and insulin, physical activity for weight management and optimal health, and nutritional supplements to enhance metabolic balance. We're going to give you a lot of specific information today that will help you address each of these aspects and how they relate to your overall health in addition to your body composition and your weight. Food is fuel for energy. Food provides energy for performing daily activities and perhaps even more importantly, it provides energy to handle all of the normal, regular, automatic processes within your body. It gives you the energy for your brain to function properly, for your heart to beat, for your lungs to breathe, for your liver to process toxins and help get them out of your system. You need energy for every single function in your body, not just those activities that you engage in like exercise or shopping or work. Now, the energy in food is contained within the macronutrients. Uh, the prefix macro in macronutrients refers to the large components within foods, which are composed of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Well, these macronutrients are measured in a unit called grams. Instead of ounces or pounds, grams are a metric unit. And a gram is about the size, a weight about the size of water in a sugar cube. So picture a, a cube of water about a half inch on each side. That weighs approximately one gram. Micronutrients, on the other hand, such as vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients, which are found in fruits and vegetables, are found in much smaller quantities and are measured in milligrams or a thousandth of a gram. And they're also measured in micrograms, which are a millionth of a gram. As you see, much smaller units because they exist in much smaller amounts within foods than the amounts of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Now, energy is measured in calories, and calories are a unit of energy. They're an amount of energy uh, that basically relates to the amount of energy it would take to increase one gram by one degree centigrade. That's one gram of water by one degree centigrade. Protein provides four calories per gram of protein. And as an example, egg white contains roughly four grams of protein. So at four calories per gram, it has 16 calories. Carbohydrate, on the other hand, uh, also provides four calories per gram which sounds strange to most people. Most people think that carbohydrates are fattening and protein isn't. In actuality, protein and carbohydrates have exactly the same amount of energy per unit weight, per gram, or per pound, or per kilogram. So an apple contains 21 grams of carbohydrates, and at 4 calories per gram, that equals 84 calories per apple. Fat, on the other hand, has 9 calories per gram. So that's over two times more calories per unit weight. So as an example, one tablespoon of oil has 14 grams of fat and provides 126 calories. So the reason why fat is fattening is because it takes just as much fat to make you feel full as it would take if you were eating protein or carbohydrates. But fat will have more than twice the amount of calories for the amount of volume that's in your stomach. So if you eat an apple-sized amount of apple, you'll get 84 calories. But if you had an apple-sized amount of fat, it would be a heck of a lot more. It would be almost 200 calories. So um, that's something to keep in mind when you eat different types of foods. Keep in mind that any time a food has more fat in it, you're going to get more calories from it. So in other words, it's best to fill up on non-fat items. Fill up on proteins and carbohydrates and not on fats or fatty foods like potato chips. Most food, however, is a mixture of protein, fat, and carbohydrate with different ratios of each of those macronutrients. So fruits and vegetables are mostly carbohydrate. Dairy foods, chicken, beef, fish are good protein sources. And some of them have a lot of fat. Some of them have very little fat. Beans have both protein and carbohydrate and very little fat. And, of course, oil and butter are pure fat. Now let's take a look at the old USDA food pyramid. You notice at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, they suggest we have a foundation of our diet being bread, cereal, rice, and pastas. 
And above that, you see vegetables and fruits. They suggest two to four servings of fruit and three to five servings of vegetables. And then above that is smaller amounts of meat, poultry, fish, dry beans, eggs and nuts, milk, yogurt, and cheese are on the left-hand side. And at the top, fats, oils, and sweets. They suggest using those sparingly. The problem with the old USDA food pyramid is they did not consult any doctors at all in developing this food pyramid. First of all, you should notice that it's the USDA food pyramid, U.S. Department of Agriculture food pyramid, not the U.S. Department of Health food pyramid. The U.S. Department of Agriculture developed this pyramid and established the ratio of the different foods as represented in the pyramid, not based on what's good for us, but based on what we all needed to consume so that we would eat everything that the farmers in this country were producing. So in other words, the food period had nothing to do with health. It had to do with creating economic security for the agricultural industry in this country. Well, this food pyramid was used for decades, and finally, we have some better food pyramids to look at. This improved food pyramid is from the University of Michigan, and you'll see in this pyramid, it has quite different ratios. The bottom of the foundation is drinking lots of water. Most people don't drink enough water. Everybody needs to drink about half their weight in ounces of water per day. So if a woman weighs 120 pounds, she should drink about 60 ounces of water. If a man weighs 200 pounds, he should drink 200 ounces of water. That's a lot of water, but that's what we need for proper health, digestion, absorption, elimination of toxins, cooling the body, and doing all sorts of other functions in the body. Next, above water, you find fruits and vegetables. United States Heart Association recommends that um, we should eat approximately five servings of fruits and vegetables every day. Uh, The U.S. Cancer Society recommends we eat about 10 servings of fruits and vegetables every day. So I suggest that everybody eats about four servings of vegetables and one serving of fruit. Most people go heavier on the fruit than the vegetables, and it needs to be the reverse. On this chart, you'll see above fruits and vegetables, you'll find grains, and those should be whole grains, not processed white flour products, but whole grains, and not just wheat. should include a bunch of different grains. And personally, I'm emphasizing non-gluten grains. I've given up gluten grains in my diet. Gluten grains include wheat, barley, rye, and commercially available oats. You can get gluten-free oats. The other gluten-free grains are rice, quinoa, amaranth, teff, and buckwheat. All very healthy grains used extensively in other cultures, not used that much in our culture yet, uh, but they should be because we're finding more and more that gluten, which is the protein in wheat, barley, rye, and oats, has adverse health consequences for many, many people very much involved with autoimmune disease, which is the number four killer in our country. Above grains, we'll see legumes. We don't eat enough legumes, beans and peas, in our culture. I emphasize the need to all my patients of eating a lot more beans and peas in their diet. Now, above that is seasonings and healthy fats. Healthy fats would include extra virgin olive oil, extra light olive oil, when you don't want the olivey taste, coconut oil, and oil from wild fish, cold water wild fish. I don't cook with anything but extra light olive oil or extra virgin olive oil or coconut oil. They're all excellent healthy oils. Above that, we find eggs and dairy, and I'd suggest organic eggs and organic dairy products. Above that is fish and seafood, and I suggest everybody eat only wild seafood. Farm-raised seafood has 30 times the amount of PCBs, dioxins, and other carcinogenic pollutants in them than wild seafood has. So you only want to use wild seafood. It's all marked in the grocery store, and if it's not, then don't buy it. Above fish and seafood is lean meat, so we should be eating less meat than fish and seafood. And then there are optional things above lean meats, what they call accompaniments, that would be desserts. And above that, I think, is fresh air. So this is a much better food pyramid than the one the U.S. Department of Agriculture came up with. This was developed at the University of Michigan several years ago, and it basically embarrassed uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture into developing a better food pyramid. The new U.S. Department of Agriculture pyramid looks quite different than the other one, and we'll see that it has several different tracks that you follow up to the top. First of all, look over the left-hand side. They want you to have fun, eat right, 
and exercise, all keys to healthy living. And then they show grains on the left. They show a mixture of whole wheat and whole grain pasta, but they also show some white pasta there too. Uh, but again, you're better off away from the white flour products. They show eating a lot of veggies, vary your veggies for different colors, fruits as well. You should use a lot of different flavors of fruits. And the focus on fruits should be fruits with stones or pits in them. Uh, the ones without stones and pits, like bananas, uh, pineapple, uh, have a lot more sugar and less fiber in them. And they show milk and dairy. They show a little bit of oil in that narrow gap between fruit and dairy. It looks like Wesson oil there that they're trying to push. And the right-hand side is meat and beans. And it says, go lean with protein. Peanut butter is in there, too, because it's a legume. So, again, that's a better representation of what we should be eating than the old food pyramid, but my preference is still the University of Michigan food pyramid. Now, there's another food pyramid called the Mediterranean Diet Pyramid. It's also a very healthy pyramid, which I like quite a bit. And you'll see that the foundation of that pyramid is being physically active, enjoying meals with others, socializing. And then above that, fruits, vegetables, grains, mostly whole, olive oil, beans, nuts, legumes, and seeds, herbs, and spices. It's comprising the bulk of your food. Above that is fish and seafood. Above that, cheese and yogurt. Above that, poultry and eggs. And then a little bit of meat. And the meat should be grass-fed meat. And then maybe a little bit of desserts up above the meat there. And off to the left-hand side, water and wine. Of course, all Europeans drink a fair amount of wine. Typically, they drink red wine. And further research shows that they drink a fair amount of their wine with their lunch meal rather than their evening meal. It tend to have, tends to have a better effect on the body that way because we find that when alcohol is consumed in the evening, it interferes the body's ability to make growth hormone, and growth hormone is absolutely essential in maintaining adequate levels of all your other hormones. So 97% of your growth hormone is made during the first two and a half hours of sleep, and virtually all of that is prevented from being produced if you consume alcohol with dinner. So in our society, of course, it's not really acceptable to have the smell of alcohol in your breath after a lunch meal if you're working and you come back to the office with alcohol in your breath. So the ideal would be to not drink alcohol during the week, but perhaps have a glass of wine with your noon meal on your weekends. Now, over the years, diets have changed. Uh, we've gone from high-carbohydrate, low-fat diets in the 70s and 80s to lower-carb, higher-protein, and higher-fat diets, such as the Atkins diet in the later 90s, more recently the zone diet, the Mediterranean and Paleolithic diets have gained favor, and these are much healthier diets. They emphasize the proper proportion between protein, fat, and carbohydrates, and Paleolithic diets in particular seem to be healthier. There's a lot less meat in Paleolithic diets. The meat that's in them is grass-fed, wild meat, hormone-free, very lean, and what really sets Paleolithic diets apart from regular diets like Mediterranean diets is that they don't have much, if any, grain in them. Many, many people will find that they can reach their ideal weight so easily if they just give up grain. Now, I've seen that a bit in myself. I've never been overweight, but once I gave up gluten grains, and I'll still eat non-gluten grains occasionally, but since I gave up gluten grains, I don't eat nearly as much grain as I used to. I lost 15 pounds over the first three months, effortlessly. That's something I think most people should at least think about. Eliminate grain or at least at least the gluten-containing grains. Now, we want to take a look at not just quantity of food, but quality as well. Um, some diets emphasize quality. Most do not. They just look at the quantity of calories, and that doesn't really lead you toward a healthy diet. So we want to make sure you don't overeat, but we also want to make sure that you eat good quality food. So the best way to ensure quality is to go with minimal processing. Basically, if it's in a bag, a box, a can, or a jar, you want to stay away from it. And that's a generalization. There are some processed foods that are okay. Coconut oil is processed and very healthy for you. Same thing with olive oil and a good purified concentrated fish oil. I mentioned purified and concentrated because regular fish oil, if it's not purified and concentrated, can have toxins in it. And you don't want those toxins. They tend to be carcinogenic, things like PCBs and dioxins. 
So you want to stick with a good quality purified concentrated fish oil and then good healthy extra virgin olive oil and coconut oil to use. Other than that, you want to pretty much stay away from processed foods. You want to eat all your foods in as close to their natural state as possible, as close to the tree, ground, or shrub as you can find them. Occasionally, you can use processed foods like whole grain, multigrain pasta, things like that. But if you feel like fruit juice, much better to eat a piece of fresh fruit than eat fruit juice. Much better to eat fresh fruit than frozen fruit. Better to eat frozen fruit than canned. Same thing with vegetables. You want to eat fresh as much as possible. Even freshly juiced fruit robs the fruit of its fiber and concentrates the sugar. And that's almost as bad for you as a soda pop. So again, go with minimally processed foods as much as possible. What we're really after is metabolic balance, uh, which is another term for glycemic balance. And what that means is a diet that keeps your blood sugar and insulin levels in proper balance. Eating good, healthy, unrefined foods is what keeps those in balance. Basically, when you processed foods, it tends to concentrate the carbohydrates, removes the fibers, and it's the fiber in food that slows down how fast sugar gets into the bloodstream. When sugar gets into the bloodstream too fast, it causes the pancreas to overscreen insulin, and that contributes to insulin resistance, which is what moves us toward diabetes. Metabolic imbalance, on the other hand, is another term for insulin resistance syndrome. Now, insulin resistance syndrome is where your body doesn't respond properly to the effect of a hormone called insulin, which your pancreas secretes, as I said before, as its response to an increase in blood sugar. And what insulin does is it helps move the sugar in the blood into your cells where it can be burned. When you don't respond properly to insulin, that contributes to insulin resistance, which leads to heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, sarcopenia, which is the increase in proportion of body fat that we see in people as they age uh, when they are not engaged in as much physical activity as their muscles need to stay healthy, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and a lot of other health problems. It develops as a result of eating refined foods, primarily refined carbohydrates. So how do you achieve metabolic balance? You consume moderate amounts of natural fiber-rich carbohydrates, fresh fruit, vegetables, and legumes. Consume the optimal amount of calories for your body's energy needs. And if you eat any highly refined or simple carbohydrate foods, such as those with refined sugar, white flour, white rice, white potatoes, fruit juice, do so rarely, if at all. Every now and then, I'll have a little natural organic maple syrup on my whole grain pancakes. But that's not a daily thing. Once every couple of weeks, I'm not going to hurt you. But you want to keep that at a minimum. It shouldn't be the norm. It should be a treat. I'd like to address the glycemic index of foods. Some foods cause a rapid increase in blood sugar. These are called high glycemic index foods. When you emphasize foods low on the glycemic index, and that's done in conjunction with an optimal calorie level, that promotes metabolic balance. Refined sugars are absorbed into the bloodstream too rapidly because they're not accompanied by enough fiber. Fiber slows down how fast sugar gets into the bloodstream. And when you don't have enough fiber with your sugars, it causes the blood sugar level to spike. That causes the pancreas to overscreed insulin, and that then leads to increased insulin resistance, which oftentimes leads to diabetes and other diseases, especially if you have a history of those diseases in your family because there's a genetic vulnerability that some people have more than others. How do you use the glycemic index for metabolic balance? Well, you choose foods lower on the glycemic index, and that'll control your blood sugar, control insulin release, and lead to better glycemic balance. Now, there's some good resources for glycemic index and also another term called glycemic load. Uh, glycemic index was the first term developed, and once they learned that fiber helps to moderate the effect of the glycemic index, they came up with the term glycemic load, which is actually more accurate. You can go to mendoza.com and see some lists of different foods and their glycemic index, but it's really not complicated. I mean, you can look at that list, and they got over 700 foods on those lists, and you'll notice if you study them at all that those foods that are highest glycemic index are processed. Those that have the lowest glycemic index are not processed. It's really that easy and straightforward. So what are some examples of low glycemic meals and snacks? Well, breakfast, a low GI cereal. You could have uh, hot cooked quinoa cereal. You could have some raw nuts or a breakfast shake. For a snack in the middle of the morning, you could have an apple or pear slices maybe with some nuts. For lunch, you could have split pea soup, 
mixed green salad, maybe with some sunflower seeds, some raw sunflower seeds on it. We always want seeds and nuts to be in their raw state. For an afternoon snack, you could do a protein shake or you could do some cheese, maybe a little bit of wine with the cheese, although the wine's not low glycemic, a little bit tastes good with cheese. I don't want to deprive you of all your joy in life. For dinner, you could have halibut, barley pilaf, asparagus, fresh fruit. I mean, that's all good food, and it's all very unprocessed. Very low glycemic leads to blood sugar balance, helps people lose fat weight. That's the other thing that's really important about glycemic balance and decreasing insulin resistance. High levels of insulin force your body to store fat and prevent your body from burning fat. So it's really important to keep your blood sugar and insulin levels in check. In addition, if your blood sugar is going up and down throughout the day, that also keeps you from burning fat. You need to keep your blood sugar levels stable in the healthy range in order to be able to burn fat. Well, you need not only glycemic balance, but you also need to balance the amount of different foods on your plate. So divide your plate into three sections. Half of it should be vegetables or salad. About a quarter of it should be whole grains or starch. You could have uh, sweet potato or starchy uh, vegetables like carrots on that side or carrot salad. And about 25% should be protein, poultry, fish, beans, soy, meat. And if you get seconds on the uh, grains, you should get seconds on the veggies and the protein as well to keep things in balance. Very often people will get seconds on the starchy foods and not seconds of the protein or the veggies. So make sure that if you get seconds on, on the starch part of your meal, that you also get seconds on the veggies and the protein. Now, what are some nutritional supplements that help lead us toward metabolic balance? Well, chromium is uh, one of the molecules that's in the insulin molecule. Your body needs plenty of chromium to make enough insulin and to help that insulin work right. Uh, you'll see the term EPA, DHA. These are specific terms for the parts of fish oil that are most healthy for you. And we find that EPA and DHA decrease insulin resistance and help lead toward glycemic balance. Alpha lipoic acid is a very potent antioxidant that decreases insulin resistance also. And it also helps prevent against the effects of aging. So it's an excellent nutrient to take. Most alpha lipoic acid on the market, however, has limited effectiveness for people because it has a very short half-life. Now that means that Within about 30 to 45 minutes, half of what you just took is gone and filtered out of the bloodstream. So the only effective way of getting alpha lipoic acid in your system and keeping it there long enough to do some good is to use a controlled release form, uh, which is the form I carry in my office. So if you need that, uh, please give us a call or come in and pick up a bottle of it. Uh, I take it myself. I take each of these myself every day. Chromium helps insulin transport glucose into the cells. It helps convert glucose into energy. And when you eat refined foods, being that during the refining process, the chromium has been removed, that means you need to take even more chromium. 50 to 200 micrograms per day is what's generally recommended. EPA, DHA improves the way a cell functions. It lowers insulin resistance, improves metabolic balance. Healthy people without any health challenges at all Usually one to two grams a day. That's one to 2,000 milligrams a day is enough. People that have health challenges, and most people do have some type of health challenges, they should be taking between two and four grams or between 2,000 and 4,000 milligrams per day. Personally, I take 2,250 milligrams per day. I don't have any health challenges, but I want to make sure I don't get any either. Again, alpha lipoic acid is an antioxidant. It helps reduce free radicals, the things that cause aging. It increases insulin sensitivity, reduces insulin resistance. It can be tricky on starting to take alpha lipoic acid. Anybody that has diabetes and is taking diabetic medication or insulin needs to be coached very, very precisely on how they can use alpha lipoic acid because if they're not and if they take alpha lipoic acid without adjusting their, their um, diabetic medication, their, their blood sugar can go so low it can be dangerous. So please, if you have a diabetes, do not take alpha lipoic acid before first talking to me or another physician that's conversant in how to, uh, how to adjust the dosage of medication and how to check your need for medication with frequent blood sugar checks. Now, regular physical activity 
is absolutely essential. We find that exercise is one of the most beneficial things you can do to help promote blood sugar balance. Exercise helps produce a healthy weight by burning excess calories and fat for fuel. And most people should exercise between 30 and 60 minutes most days of the week. Six days a week we find works just as well as seven days a week. So in reviewing what our strategies are for optimal metabolic balance, eat balanced amounts of protein, carbohydrate, and fat. Maximize high-quality, low-glycemic foods, unprocessed foods, with an emphasis on wild fish, free-range, grass-fed beef and bison, organic fruits and vegetables, raw nuts and seeds, healthy oils such as olive oil and coconut oil and fish oil, and quality nutritional supplements, and get regular physical activity. Ideally, choose physical activities that you enjoy. That way you can uh, add life to your years as well as years to your life. So doing all these things maximizes health, energy, vitality, and reduces fatigue and helps prevent disease. So thank you very much for joining me for this presentation. I look forward to seeing you at our next presentation where you can learn more about all the things you can do to help give you the most amazing, healthy life possible. Thank you and goodbye.